it is a remarkable and conclusive result of contemporary physics that there are not, nor can there be, any objects which satisfy the conditions discussed in the previous video. We will here give a brief account of this story in a way that will bring out its metaphysical aspects. Consider the problem of change. Descartes considers this problem by discussing a ball of wax, which when heated becomes liquid. How do we know that the liquid wax is the same wax as the old, old uh, solid wax, given that the two appear so different to our senses? How is it possible for something that is solid to become something that is liquid, or for something that is liquid to become something that is gaseous, say, water to steam? Is it the same thing which is first solid and then liquid? Or has something that was solid changed into something else that is liquid? What does physics tell us? First of all, physics tells us that solids, liquids, and gases are all made up of tiny particles called molecules, too small to be seen with the eye. The molecules are in a state of constant motion, and the amount of their motion depends on the temperature of their object, or of the object. At relatively low temperatures, molecule, uh, molecular motion is small, which allows the molecules to get close to one another, forming a solid. At higher temperatures, the molecules move too fast to get close to one another, but not fast enough to altogether escape from one another's company, and they begin to roll over one another. This comprises the liquid state. At still higher temperatures, the molecules move too fast to enter into any relationship with one another, thus forming the gaseous state. So given a change, say, of solid ice to liquid water to gaseous steam, we say, one, that the individual molecules that constitute the given piece of ice are the same molecules that constitute the water and the steam. Two, the degree of motion of the molecules determines whether the molecules arrange themselves in solid, liquid, or gaseous form. And three, this degree of motion is affected by the temperature. The general, that is to say, metaphysical structure of this explanation is as follows. Given an observed qualitative change, solid to liquid, Physics postulates the existence of something that does not change and explains the qualitative transformation of solid to, li to liquid in terms of quantitative differences among the molecules. The intuition here is that the fact of qualitative change would be a deep mystery. It would violate the principle of sufficient reason unless there were some cause for the change through which the change could be understood. And this understanding seems to consist in seeing that the qualitatively uh, distinct solid and liquid are merely different manifestations or different states of the same underlying reality, namely the molecules that constitute them. Now, continuing this line of reasoning, molecules themselves can undergo qualitative change. For example, a water molecule can, under suitable conditions, transform into molecules of hydrogen and oxygen. This transformation would be as mysterious as frogs transforming into princes if there were nothing that remained invariant under the transformation. So, as before, physics postulates the existence of something, atoms, in this case, that will remain unchanged during the transformation and in terms of which the transformation can be understood. Thus, the atoms that make up the water molecules before the change are the very same atoms that, after the change, make up the oxygen and hydrogen molecules. The different compounds are merely different arrangements of the same underlying stuff, the atoms, and that's how it is possible for different compounds to change one into another. Recalling the third criterion for ultimate particles, one way of telling that the molecule is not an ultimate unit of matter is that a given molecule can be created and destroyed in time. That which remains invariant, that which does not change, during a given transformation is more fundamental, more basic, more ultimate, or more real than that which comes into being and or passes away during the transformation. So, during the transformation of water into hydrogen and oxygen, we say that because the atoms that make up the uh, initial water molecules are the same atoms that make up the final hydrogen and oxygen molecules, whereas the water molecule ceases to exist and the hydrogen and oxygen mo molecules begin to exist, that therefore the atoms are more fundamental objects than the molecules. What about the atoms themselves? Do they satisfy the conditions for being an ultimate unit of matter? The answer is, of course, no. 
since they too undergo qualitative change. For under appropriate conditions, a given atom can transform into two or more other, uh, other atoms, this process is called fission, or two or more different atoms can combine to form a single atom, fusion. Physics explains this transformation by postulating the existence of something that remains invariant as the atoms change, in terms of which the atoms themselves are defined, and in uh, such a way that the possibility of such qualitative change can be understood. So as everyone knows, the atom is defined in terms of the so-called elementary particles, neutrons, protons, electrons, and so forth, and transformations among atoms are simply different uh, arrangements of the same elementary particles. Thus, when a given uranium atom decays into two other atoms, the same protons, neutrons, and electrons that formerly uh, constitute the uranium, uranium atom now constitute the two new atoms. During the transformation, the uranium atom ceases to exist, and the other two atoms begin to exist, but the elementary particles remain the same. It is for this reason that the elementary particles are regarded as more fundamental than the atoms which they constitute. What about the elementary particles themselves? Do they satisfy our criteria for being ultimate units of matter? The answer is, perhaps surprisingly, no, because every elementary particle can be created and destroyed. That is to say, they undergo qualitative transformations similar to, and in some ways more dramatic than, the transformations that occur at the atomic and molecular level. The elementary part particles can transform not only into one another, but also into pure energy. To account for this change, we again postulate the existence of some underlying stuff that remains invariant as the particles undergo transformation. It is at this point the, uh, that atomistic methodology, which was so successful until now, breaks down completely. For it is not possible to regard this invariant underlying stuff as a still smaller particle. To be sure, physicists have tried to apply atomistic methodology to explain particle transformation, but the quarks which they postulate to constitute the particles fail to satisfy the conditions for an atomistic metaphysics. For one thing, the quarks also undergo qualitative transformation, both into one another and into other particles, and thus bring us no closer to the ultimate units of matter which atom atomism requires. But more interestingly, quarks cannot exist separately. That is to say, quarks cannot exist apart from the particles that they constitute. Now a bunch of parts that cannot exist independently of the whole that they constitute are not really parts at all. The quarks, because they do not exist independently of the whole that they supposedly constitute, fail to satisfy the independence criterion in addition to failing the criterion of permanence for an atomistic framework. So back to our search for an underlying stuff or substance that remains invariant as the particles transform. This basic stuff, according to the physics, according to physics, is pure energy. Consider the following example. Suppose we have an electromagnet and, uh, and gradually increase the intensity of the magnetic field between the poles. When the intensity of the magnetic fields reaches a certain level, electrons and positrons will be observed to emanate from the regions of space between the poles. According to physics, before the creation of the particles that the magnetic field contained a certain amount of energy. After the creation of the particles, the energy, the energy in the magnetic field is reduced by an amount equal to that required to create a particle. This is known uh, none other than with Einstein's equation, E equals mc squared. Thus the total energy before and after the appearance of the particles is constant and hence energy represents a more fundamental level of being than do the particles. Indeed, the particle itself is a form of energy. And since particles make up atoms, which make up molecules, which make up everything else, the basic stuff, which constitute the being of everything physical, is energy. Particulate matter is one form in which energy can exist. Non-particulate matter, or field, is another form. Thus we have shown that there are no variable candidates for the position of ultimate units of matter, and that every proposed candidate violates the criterion of permanence and or independence. Physics also tells us, and I will uh, merely state this without going into the details, that there can exist no object that is both extended in space and simple. 
Anything that occupies space cannot be simple. That is, it must have an internal structure. And so the concept of something that is solid, matter through and through, is vacuous according to physics. So if there were to exist an ultimate unit of matter, it could not have any extension in space.